Hi, in this video I'm going to show how the equations fit inside the components of envelope. Let's get started. I'll add a mass here. What does that mean we have a mass? Well, uh, I've selected the mass and over on the right I can see its properties. The properties of the mass are first of all some variables. Uh, its x variable is its horizontal coordinate, so they're little, each line is a variable, and the tags on the right tell you what the variable means. So we're at about minus two units uh, x-coordinate. The dark dots are the x-axis and the y-axis, and there's one dot per meter, so minus two means two to the left. Zero means that we're zero up and down. Vx is the horizontal velocity, and Vy is the vertical velocity. So if I actually set this horizontal velocity, say to one meter per second, I can hit play and we should just see this lone mass moving over to the right by about one meter per second. I'll eliminate this equation panel, component properties panel, so it doesn't get in the way. One one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand. It's very close to real time, but the, real, the time that matters in the simulation is this T up top. And you can also see the time bar moving on the bottom. I can advance time in the simulation or bring it backwards so I can bring the mass back to its starting point or look for any special situations I want. We set all this up, there's no force on the mass, it just has an initial velocity and that's how masses behave. That's Newton's, uh, whichever law it is, mass uh, in motion tends to remain in motion. So we'll look at uh, the next level of of kind of interest is if we put a force on the mass, but first let's look a little more at the properties. So mass not only has an x and y position, an x and y velocity, it also has a mass, which is one unit here, uh, we've got built into this particular mass component numbers for gravity and for friction, but they're both set to zero, so we have no gravity and no friction here. We've got, say, outer space or an air hockey table. Uh, the third equation, the excuse me, the third category here is equations. The um, equations are code here in these white boxes that actually controls how the component behaves. So, uh, in this case, we have four differential equations. The first equation is uh, the rate of change of x is equal to vx. So the rate of change of the horizontal coordinate is equal to this to the horizontal velocity. That's actually this one was what made it move to the right in the example I just showed you. Then we have this the uh, similar the same equation but vertically. The rate of change in the y coordinate is the vertical velocity. These serve as definitions for the velocities, the components of the velocity. Uh, the third and fourth equations are f equals ma from mechanics. So vx is the horizontal velocity, vx prime, the, the time derivative, is the horizontal acceleration. So this is acceleration equals uh, handle means something from outside the component, and fx is a force. So we have horizontal acceleration equals a force from outside divided by the mass. Acceleration equals force over mass is one of Newton's laws. So people write it most often as you multiply by mass on both sides, ignore the second term on the right, and you've got uh, ma equals f. Uh, f equals ma is a you know what you use to, to do point mass mechanics. Uh, the second term puts into effect the uh, friction that I just told you about. And then we've got f equals ma in the y direction as well. Kinetic energy is, is just an output. It's not wired into uh, the behavior of the mass. It's just a nice thing to be able to plot. So I created a mass by actually writing this code, these equations, and hiding them inside a little circle. That's why masses behave the way they do in envelope. If if you get the equations wrong, or, or if you put in something from electronics and chemistry, then you'll have that. Here's another mass. What I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to take away our initial velocity on the first mass. So we've got two masses both initially stationary, and I'll connect them with a spring. So we'll have a second example of a motion here. Now spring has equations too. The spring now is this green horizontal line and it's highlighted. Uh, it draws off center in case you have more than one thing connected, but I'll leave that, I'll uh, draw it on center instead. Um, the spring calculates its own length and a force that it puts on its the objects at its two ends. So those external forces on the masses right now will not be zero necessarily. They'll, they'll be whatever force is determined by the spring. The spring force is given by something called Hooke's Law. It's, a, it's some k, a constant, k 
here, if I look up in constants, is 100. The constant times uh, how much the spring is deformed. So if the, if the spring's length, L is the instantaneous length of the spring at each moment. If the spring's length is the same as its rest length, uh, the zero force length, then, there, then the whole force will be zero, K times zero. If the spring's actual length is, is longer, then the spring will be trying to compress and the force will be negative. Um, or the force will be inward on these two masses. And uh, on the other hand, if we compress the spring to smaller than its rest length, less than one meter, it'll push the two masses on its ends outward. Let's change the rest length to a, a couple of meters. The masses are spaced by three meters and we'll make the rest length two so that we'll have the masses oscillate but not move past each other. It solves then we have the masses bouncing back and forth. Now we can make plots so that we can see things a little more quantitatively. Let's plot with time on the horizontal axis and the first mass is x-coordinate going vertically. So that mass's x-coordinate varies between minus one and minus two. Uh, and it just repeats again and again over time. Let's make sure that's really happening. And sure enough, that mass goes to about minus two and about minus one. All right, we can plot the position of the second mass also. And we'll see um, here are both masses positions. The second mass goes between the origin and, uh, and point one uh, meter to the right on the x-axis, which is just what we see in this in the animated view. So then uh, we can plot other things. We can plot this kinetic energy. Uh, the kinetic energy will vary actually twice per cycle. It goes twice as fast. Uh, it's still sinusoidal, but varies twice as rapidly as the position because when the position is changing fastest upwards and downwards, those are both uh, maximums of kinetic energy, maxima. So you can plot everything. Let's go uh, for our grand finale here, uh, something out of the, off of the x-axis. I'll give the mass on the right a little kick vertically. So we'll give it an initial velocity upwards. And I'll give the mass on the left an initial velocity downwards. So that the whole thing should spin around. But it also, I haven't stopped its tendency to oscillate in and out. So we get a more complicated motion here. All still driven just by the same equations with different initial conditions. So we've got a system of equations. Each mass has four uh, ordinary differential equations. We've got a system of eight differential equations. And, and each spring, depending on how you count it, has about two algebraic equations. Um, so we've got about 10 equations here that, that we are managing, um, but without a lot of effort because we can just drag and drop. All right. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Bye.